us to enter into your courts one more time. Father, some of us deal with issues every day, Father. We fall short of your glory, Father. We stand before you, Father. We're just dirt rich. You made it to living life, living breath. But, Father, we come here asking for a cleansing. We come here, Father, as we enter you, enter to your presence, Father, that you take away our sins. Relieve us from our, the matters of, 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 of this past weekend, the, the matters of what's at work, the, the problems back at home, Father. Let us come in here, Father, for this. You're, 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 you're like a father and a mother at the same time. Yeah. Like you rock us in your arms, Father, when we sit in your heart. Father, we ask that you lose us, Father, from our situations, trials, and tribulations. Break every yoke and loose every, every shackle and chain in our lives, Father. We come to you for growth, Father. We come for you for strength, Father. Help us to love our brothers and our sisters in spite of the situation. Let us not judge, but not themselves. It says, just not Father. Father, we look, Father, to the hills from which cometh our help, for we all our help coming from you, dear Heavenly Father. Father, touch and bless and anoint our choir, Father, so as they sing, Father, and praise is lifted up to you, the burdens are lifted also. But the yoke is made easy, Father. Father, we just come to you as the word is being brought forth also. Let it seek, Father, through our flesh, break through our hearts, and look through the windows of our soul and cross our spirits. So, Father, those who came in one way, Father, we will not be the same. Yes. For it's only by you, Father, that we're changed. Not by one another, in spite of what they may think, in spite of what others may say. It's only through you, Father, we are changed. In your precious name, Father, we pray. Let the church say amen. amen.
once again next Sunday and every Sunday after that. May we all stand and greet everybody in love. Give
greatness and awesomeness of God inhabit, inhabiting His praises. And we're going to look at that, a little bit of uh, that today because if we turn back, if you, you pick up your pew Bible, it's just right underneath your seat if you want to follow along. Matthew chapter 11, verse 9 and 10. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first part of verse 9, but I want you to respond back with the Hosanna and the blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord and the blessed is the King of our Father David. And I want you to declare that with a loud, strong voice. Okay, I, I've heard you guys out there on the, uh, the ceremony field. You know, I've heard you guys out there running in formation. I know you guys have strong voices. So let's, let's overwhelm the Lord with our strong voice this day. Verse 9. Those who went before and those who cried out saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of our Father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's just pray the Lord. Hallelujah. What a festive moment. What a joyous occasion. I mean, here you have, I want you to picture this. Here you have people assembled in the streets, and they're crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna! And they're throwing down their palm leaves and their cloaks, and they're paying honor and tribute to this man who's riding on a colt, on a donkey. Of course, we know, friends, that that person riding on a colt is none other, none other than Messiah. None other than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. None other than our Savior and our Lord. We can sit here today and we can reflect back on history. We can reflect back on the text, on Scripture, and know that in just a few short moments that Jesus Christ will be crucified on a tree and He will die. But there's not the it doesn't end here. It doesn't. Because in how many days, somebody? Three. How many days, somebody? Three. In three days, Jesus goes, rock be cast aside because I have died and it is finished. I have paid the, the final price. I have paid and laid the final sacrifice. And because of this selfish act, I can now declare through me, through my blood, you Amen. Jesus Christ Amen. rises from the dead. Friends, I guarantee you, as people were assembled on that road, on those streets, as they were crying out, Hosanna, some folks knew exactly who Jesus Christ was. Many of them are just like us. Whenever we see a crowd and something going on, they were drawn just because there was some kind of ruckus and commotion. They saw something going on and so they were they were curious and they approached it. And I guess, you know, it went in Rome, do like the, the oh, Romans, yeah. right? I mean, just join in. Okay, everyone's throwing cloaks down. Everyone's throwing palm leaves down. Everyone's shot Hosanna. I guess I'll do that too. Hosanna. But they had no clue. They had no idea who that man riding the cloak was. They had no idea that that was their Savior, their Lord, the one that they hoped for for thousands of years throughout the Old Testament, the one that the prophets pointed to and said, this will be the Messiah, this will be the Savior that comes to wipe away the sins of the world. Well, they had no clue, no idea. Friends, I want to tell you something. Would you just not nudge your neighbor and say, hey, uh, listen up, pay attention. I guarantee you, I bet every cent in my bank account. And I've been deployed. I've been able to save up quite a bit. I'll bet every red cent, every penny in my bank account that there are someone here, and I dare say many people here, seated right here, some who stood up and they were clapping and moving, trouble, don't that, and, you know, and, and, and just worshiping God. But they're clueless. They have no idea who that man is, who that man is. There's someone here. So I want to share with you a message that's been brewing inside of me for some time. This week I want to turn our entire focus to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I know you say, wait a minute, chaplain, that's not unusual. As a matter of fact, we always sing about Jesus Christ in chapel. When you or Minister Bahoda or whomever preaches, they're always 
preaching about Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, I am convinced that a good number of us are walking around with an incomplete picture of who Jesus Christ truly is and what the big deal about Jesus is. Now, let me share with you, friends. It's been more than 30 years that I've made a commitment to believe in Jesus Christ in His death and His resurrection it's been more than 30 years that I've placed my faith on that man that rode one day into Jerusalem on a colt, on a donkey. My life has never been the same ever since. At the age of seven years old, with a simple faith, in a Sunday school class, I remember, even remember the name of my teacher, Lucy Eller, as she presented the gospel of Jesus Christ on a simple flannel graph board and told me, Jesus Christ loves you. I dared at seven years old to believe that. I dared to say a simple prayer when the simple lady by the name of Lucy Allen said, Jesus Christ, I've sinned and I've come falling short of the glory of God. And I trust that you are my Savior, that you are my Lord. And I will serve you as long as I live. Amen. It's been over 30 years. And there's been, there's a lot about that event I have to be up frank with you. I don't remember. I remember saying that prayer. I remember Lucy Eller, my Sunday school teacher. I remember right after Sunday school class, we had cookies, Oreo cookies, and we had some lunch. I, but, I, you know, I don't remember anything physically happening. I don't remember ever being sapped by a bolt of lightning or electricity coming and, and taking over my body. I don't remember any of those other kind of peripheral things. But one thing I know for certain, one thing I know without a doubt, friends, is that on that day, Jesus Christ invaded my life. And that decision set me on a course that forever changes and transforms and changes my life to this very day. Amen. Now, for more than a quarter of a century, think about that. Somebody say, Chaplain, you don't that. I'm not. Now, for more than a quarter of a century, I've walked with Jesus Christ. And yes, there have been times when I've strayed. Yes, there's been times when I've been disobedient. And like in any relationship, there have been many times when I felt distant from God. And or times when I didn't talk much to God. Times when I couldn't figure God out. Times when things would happen in my life and I couldn't quite understand what God was doing in my life. But there also have been a lot of times when I have been unbelievably close to God. When I've known the presence of God was there with me, walking with me, blessing me, prospering me. My journey with God over these last 30 years has been, friends, let me tell you, let me be absolutely frank and look into my eyes because I want you to, to hear the sincerity and see the sincerity. Walking with God for over the last 30 years has been a blessing. And it's been a decision that I've never regretted. Never regretted. When I stop to think about that, when I stop to think how God has been in my life, my life overflows, spills forward, overflows with gratitude that the great God of the universe would let me, would dare to let me to know Him personally and would adopt me into His family. Doesn't call me servant. Doesn't call me peasant or peon or sinner. Says you are saved. You are sanctified. You are redeemed. You are cleansed by, by the blood of my Son, Jesus Christ. And now you are my very Son, the apple of my eye. Amen. Wow. Think about that. God doesn't owe me anything. I don't deserve God's grace. You don't, friend, deserve God's grace. And I am fully aware of how unlovable I can be. I am very aware how sinful I can be and how darkness can reside within the depths of my heart. Yet, the God of the universe who spoke the universe into existence, who created the stars and the world, is the God who accepts me, who pays attention to me, and notices me. Wow. See, I, I bet the farm, friends, that Jesus is who He says He is in the Bible. And for me, friends, there is no plan B. There is only following Jesus Christ. I want to know Him more. And friends, this morning I stand in front of you declaring to you, I want you to know Him. I want you to know the real Jesus. And quite honestly, folks, 
When I hear some people talk about Jesus, I find myself sometimes feeling a little perplexed, sometimes a little puzzled, sometimes saddened, and honestly, sometimes angry. When I hear some people talk about Jesus in my mind, I think, who are you talking about? Because the Jesus you describe is not the Jesus that I know, nor is He the Jesus we find within the pages of the Bible, the New Testament. Sometimes I'm angered because the one that I've walked with for now, now for 30 years, I feel is often misrepresented. Come on, Alex. See, if you were to study the history of Christianity, you would find that down through the ages, generations have come to critical crisis points. Times where they've debated exactly who Jesus is and what his true identity was. Questions about his identity can be traced back all the way, all the way back, friends, to when Jesus walked this earth. As a matter of fact, there's, there's a great passage, Luke chapter 9, verse 18 through 20, if you're taking notes. Luke chapter 9, verse 18 through 20, as you, some of you turn to that, I just quickly grab a, refresh my throat. Somebody say, praise God, oh me, oh my, thank God, somebody. <laughs> somebody rejoice, somebody get God the glory. Luke chapter 9, verse 18 through 20, says, Once when Jesus was praying in private, and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they, that is the disciples, replied, Well, See, Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others that you are one of the prophets of long ago that's come back to life. Now listen, Jesus looks right at them, right into their eyes and says, What about you? Come on now. Yes, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, get this, Jesus Christ. The Son of the living God. See, Jesus comes to the disciples one day and He says to them, what's the word out on the street about me? What do people say I am? Of course, you know, they, you heard the reply. They say, well, some Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're an Old Testament prophet that's come to life. What if Jesus were to come, friends, into this chapel right now? What if Jesus were to walk right through those doors and come stand right before you in front of this altar right here? What if Jesus were to say, hey, what's the word out on the street about me? What are people saying here on Cobb Spiker about me? Who do people say that I am? How would you answer? See, I think my answer would be something like this. There are a lot of people who think, Jesus, that you're a really nice guy. That you're a great religious teacher. That, that you're a, a kind and gentle soul. And there's a good number of people who would even say that you're a God, but you're one of many gods. And that you came many, many years ago to, to give us some kind of spiritual enlightenment or some kind of spiritual truth. And by the way, Jesus, there's a whole lot of people that you're just that think that you're just about blessing them. And really that you're here just to give them a good life. You know what I mean? To give them riches and cars and houses and, and, and success and money. Then in Luke chapter 9, Jesus turns from the opinion of the people to asking the disciples a direct and personal question. What do you guys say? Who do you say that I am? Friend, I want to be really clear about this point here because this is a very very, very important question. How you answer this question of who Jesus is really does matter today, friends. In fact, I would say that answering that question is the mother of all final exams. And if you flunk this one, you don't just get sent back a grade. You don't just get sent into remedial education, friends. If you flunk this one, you flunk life. If you flunk this one, you flunk eternal life. If you believe the Bible at all, you know that eternity weighs in the balance of how you answer this question. So I ask you, friends, who is Jesus? See, I love the way Peter, I love Peter in this story. He doesn't wait to hear what the other disciples have to say. He doesn't try to figure out what the politically correct
correct answer is or try to wait to see what the opinion polls come in. He doesn't try to turn into CNN and see what all the talking heads have to say about Jesus Christ. He dives right into it and he takes a stand and says boldly, You are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You are God in the flesh. You are Messiah. You are the Messiah that we have been waiting so many centuries, so many years for. And the identity of Jesus Christ, friends, is not determined by opinion polls. The approval rating doesn't determine who Jesus Christ is. He is, let me tell you a secret, friends. Wake up, listen here. Jesus Christ is who He is because the Bible says so. Jesus Christ is who He is because Jesus said so. Jesus Christ is who He is because God Almighty parted the heavens, opened up the heavens and declared, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. See, that's not my claim for Him. That's not this preacher's opinion. This is the claim that Almighty God has in what Jesus Christ. I want to take you to another passage of Scripture. It's familiar to a lot of us here. It's a passage, a scripture that we know as the great commandment. One day Jesus was asked, what's the most important command that God has for us in scripture? And we often summarize the answer to Jesus' question like this. Love God. Love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love what? Your neighbor as your very self. Amen? But there's a very important part of his response that we often skip over. If you want to see it, you can see it in Mark chapter 12, verse 9. Jesus said the most important command is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only one. See, before he ever talked about loving God or loving other people, he says, I want you to first understand God the Father is. This verse is really a quote from the Old Testament from the book of Deuteronomy and was considered to be the most important passage out of all the Old Testament. In fact, whenever a Hebrew child was learning about the things of God, the very first verse of the Bible they were ever taught was to memorize this verse from Deuteronomy. In Hebrew it sounded like this. Shama. Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. Every Jewish mother and every father knew the most important lesson they could teach their child, their kid, is to understand who God is. And the most important lesson that you and I can learn, the most find foundational truth that has the greatest implication for our lives is understanding the true identity of Jesus Christ. Here's the truth I want you to get. Here's what I want you to come away with. You see, your, listen carefully, your view determines what your value is, which in turn determines what you do. Let me explain this a little clearer. What you believe ultimately determines how you behave. Would you say that with me? Would you say, what I believe, what I believe ultimately, determines ultimately determines how I behave. How I behave. Friends, and your lifestyle is determined by a set of values by a set of beliefs that you hold. So what you believe matters. And what you believe about Jesus Christ matters most of all. It has practical, eternal implications because ultimately how you live your life will determine what you really believe about God and what you really believe about Jesus Christ. So I want to share two biblical portraits, pictures of Jesus Christ that I think should shape our view of Him and give us a complete picture of who Jesus Christ is. So let's jump into this. Take your notes. You're ready to write the first one down? It's this. Jesus pursues us. Jesus pursues us out of a great love for us. Friends, what does it mean to be pursued? In the 
this case to be the object of desire. Think about this, friends. Every single one of you, every person within the sound of my voice, every person within a cop spiker, every person throughout Iraq, Iraqi, American, whomever, every person throughout this region in the world, God des desired to be in relationship with them, with you. You are the apple, the very desire and heart of God. And what God says is, I passionately want to be in relationship with you, and I passionately pursue you. Friends, that's what John 3.16 is all about, isn't it? Yes. For God so loved the world, yes. that whosoever yes. should not, what? Yes. But have everlasting life. In the Old Testament, the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, we read these words. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save, and He will take great delight in you. Would you say, God, did you great delight in you? He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Did you hear that? He will rejoice over you with singing. That last phrase, He will rejoice over you with singing. If you were to go back to the original Hebrew, Friends, that's what the Old Testament was written in. You would find that that phrase literally has this idea. And when I share it with you, it should explode in your spirit. I mean, I expect people to jump up and shout, Hallelujah, praise God, Amen, glory to God, thank, thanks be to God's grace. Here it is. It literally has the idea of dancing over someone with delight. See, that's the picture of God. If you didn't get it, let me make it clearer. The God of the universe, almighty and powerful God who spoke the worlds into existence, dances in delight over you. Yes. See, John Aldridge has written a book called yes. The Sacred Romance. In his book, let me read this small little segment. It says, for centuries... Prior to the modern era of the church, the church viewed the gospel as a romance. A romance between Almighty Creator God, whose heart and passion is for humanity. Did you get that? But it seems like, somebody say, Omi. Oh, but it seems like in the modern church, the gospel has become dry and unexciting and unromantic, and it's more like an IRS form than a romance. It's true, and it has all the data, all the theology is there, but it just doesn't take your breath away. The romance is gone. Yet I'm convinced that when we really began to grasp the fact that God of the universe, the great big God of heaven, pursues us, and loves us, and notices us, and dance with delight over us, my friend, that will take your breath away. That should stir your heart. That should get your heart pounding. That should excite you. That should want to make you jump up and start dancing for joy. That should make you want to shout out, Hosanna, glory to the God and King and Savior. Amen. I'm sure that most of you somewhere along the way in life have heard the name Helen of Troy. You ever heard of that name before? Yes. See, Helen of Troy was one, one of the beautiful women of the ancient world who caused two kingdoms to war against each other. Yeah. It was because of her that thousands of men lost their lives so that one man could claim Helen as his own. It was Helen who authors wrote saying, her face, because it was so beautiful, launched a thousand ships. She was the wife of the king of Greece in the 9th century B.C. and was living a life of prosperity and tranquility until one day, one day, somebody say, uh-oh. Uh-oh. One day, a young man by the name of Paris, who was the prince of Troy, showed up. And friends lust to go over his heart. Prince Paris was so captivated by her beauty that he fell madly in love with her. Then one night, under the cover of darkness, he had his own special operation, and he stole her away and took her back to the kingdom of Troy. Now, the king of Greece was mad. He was infuriated.
that he had lost his true love. So he amassed a great army and launched a thousand ships to go and attack Troy and bring back his wife, his beloved Helen. See, this woman became a, the center of an international crisis, and the king pursued her with everything, everything that he had. Friend, the Bible says that you and I are the beloved of God. And that because of our sin, and because of our separation from God, we have created not an international crisis, but a cosmic crisis, a, a crisis of cosmic proportion. And God has launched His ships for us. God has not spared anything for us. In fact, He sent His only beloved Son for us. And we are the pursued of the King. Would you say the great King and God of the universe pursues me? The King and God of the universe pursues me. See, I think that deep down inside every single one of us, there's a longing to know your love. To feel that somehow in this world, that we matter to somebody. Friends, if you your heart, your heart's breaking right now and you just needed to hear from someone this encouraging word, let me give it to you. You are cared for by someone. You are loved for by someone. You are longed for by someone. Someone cares about you and that is the great God and the great King of this universe. Amen. See, God delights in you. That's what the passage says. And if you ever doubt God's undeniable love for you, you only have to go to one place. One place you have to go. Go to a little stable, a little humble stable outside of Bethlehem, and in there find a little baby born to parents, Joseph and Mary, named Jesus. This is the evidence of how much God delights in you. See, I love the passage in John. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says these words about Jesus. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the universe. I like that. God became flesh and life and death and resurrection to once and for all time. Answer this important question. What does God think about me? At the point of my deepest need, at the point of my rebellion against God, at the point of my rejection and my betrayal of God and my sinfulness, the Bible declares this, and while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. At the point of my rejection and my betrayal, God became flesh in the person of Jesus and died on the cross so that I could live with Him now and know Him and be in personal relationship. Amen. Friends, Amen. God desires. Listen to the words of Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same that Jesus Christ had. Though He was God, He did not demand and cling to His right as God. He made Himself nothing. Would you say nothing? Nothing. He made Himself nothing. He took on the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And in human form, He obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on the cross. Friends, cross, not a piece of decoration or jewelry, a cross, an instrument of execution and death, a, an instrument of shame and death. A cross is not just a symbol, it is the very hinge of history. It is the very center of the universe. It is the defining event in all of human history. Why would Jesus, according to this passage in Philippians chapter 2, lay aside all the prestige, all of the privileges of heaven, and lay aside His kingdom and His power and take upon Himself a human body, a frail human body, and walk among us and live among us and then willingly lay down His life and be nailed to a tree? Why would He do that? His friend, He delights in you. Amen. He rejoices over you. He wants to be in a relationship. The second thing, this is that I close. Today, Palm Sunday, we rejoice because Jesus did this. 
Jesus is our groom. Jesus is our groom. To see this, I want to take you to the final chapter of the, of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. If you were to go to Revelation chapter 19, you would find the description of Jesus coming to earth again. The first time, you see, friends, Jesus came to this planet. He came as a little, lowly, humble little baby in a lowly manger in Bethlehem. He came to live among us and to die on the cross to secure our salvation. But the Bible says that the next time Jesus comes, it will be very, very different. The next time Jesus comes, He will come in glory and in power. And He will come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will come to rule and to reign. And that's how He's going to come the next time. In that description, in chapter 19, there's also another description. The description of something that happens in heaven called... Let me just pause here. How many of you guys like the good fire? Good party. Anybody like going to a good party? Good celebration. Okay. Well, here's good news. In heaven, there's going to be this grand party, this grand celebration called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And those of you whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're invited. As a matter of fact, you're a guest of honor. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad. And give Him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And His bride. Would you say that's me? That's me. That's me. And His bride. We are His bride. Has made herself ready. Think about this, friends. Of all the images that God could have chosen to describe our relationship with Him in heaven, God chooses a marriage relationship. You see, God could have described it as a king and slave relationship. God could have described it as holy, mighty God and you peasant, sinful human. But God doesn't choose to do that. God uses, rather, the most private and intimate and most tender experiences on earth, the union of a husband and a wife to convey the kind of relationship that He wants to have with you and that you will have with Him throughout eternity. Amen. Somebody say, thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I've had a chance to reflect on this, folks. And in Jewish weddings, they do uh, things a little bit differently. Than you know, they don't have the preacher dressed up as, uh, as Elvis at a, at a wedding chapel. Okay? They do things a little bit differently than we do. The typical Jewish wedding in biblical times had three phases to it. And I'll go through that quickly. I don't want to bore you with the details, but it's going to make a powerful point here, so stay with me. The first phase was a kind of contractual agreement between the groom and the bride. The groom was in fact agreeing to take the woman as his wife. The groom in the contract says, I assume all responsibilities for my bride. The second phase was the coming of the groom to get the bride. And sometimes that would even be an unannounced. The last phase, the third phase, was the same. But more importantly, the feast or the celebration that would sometimes last for days. Also, unlike our weddings today, all that get this, all of the arrangements in those days were not made by the bride's family, but by the groom and his family. And the only responsibility that the bride had was to make herself beautiful, to make herself ready and be prepared for the coming of her groom. Now here's the analogy, friends, and I hope this excites you. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God has entered into an agreement, a marriage covenant with you, where God says, if you will take my son and you will receive him as Savior and Lord, I will make you my own. I will make you my bride. I will make you my beloved. You see, that agreement is already secure. It's already finalized when Jesus Christ on the cross when he was nailed said, It is finished. It is finalized if you receive Jesus Christ. And now we're waiting for the coming of the groom. And we're waiting for the party to begin. Amen. Here's the point, friends. Friend, your future in Jesus Christ is secure. Amen. You see, we don't serve a fickle God. 
God says of himself, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not like one who courts and says, you know what, I don't love you anymore. Something's changed. God's passion for you, God's love for you will never change. It burns as hot and as brightly as it did the first moment God created the universe before the foundations of the world as it does right at this very moment. It's interesting that when you read in the Bible about eternal life, and I'm talking about the original Hebrew and the original Greek, most often God talks about eternal life in the present tense. And even though we're not there, even though we're on this side of eternity, whenever you read it in Scripture, God speaks in, in the form and shape that you already are there, that you already have a piece of eternity, that Jesus Christ has saved you. Your future is so secure and your place in heaven with Jesus Christ is so certain that God talks about it as though it's already happened right now. Friend, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, how many have Jesus Christ as your Savior? Hallelujah! It belongs to you. It's yours. So no matter what you're facing today, no matter what you're facing today, you can rest assured that you have the agreement the covenant, the marriage covenant from God, that there is a wedding day coming when you will be reunited with your groom, where you will see Jesus Christ, your Savior, face to face, and Jesus Christ will receive you as His own and embrace you and express God's unfathomable love for you. That's God's promise. And we can take that, friends, to the bank. We don't have to be afraid of what lies on the other side of death. It's simply our wedding day. Amen. There's a great story, and I'll close with this. Would you permit me to take a drink? Just worship God while I'm like, oh, I'm refresh my Sir Winston Churchill, the leader of the United Kingdom, Great Britain, who when he got into his late years, he was planning his funeral. See, he wanted to be laid in state in the heart of London because his very heart was for his country and his people. He wanted to be laid, buried in the heart of London in the center of St. Paul's Cathedral, right there in church where he had spent much of his time. At the beginning of the service, he wanted, a, he wanted his casket to be laid underneath the dome. And at the beginning of the service, he wanted a, a trumpeter on the balcony to play taps at the beginning of his memorial service. And then at the end, get this, at the end of his memorial service, he wanted two trumpeters stationed on the other side of the balcony to play Reveille, the military wake-up song. Because you see, Churchill understood that death, friends, wasn't the end. That death is simply and merely a wake-up call. It is a summons that declares, now is your wedding day. Now you will see your Savior face to face, your groom face to face. It is the coming of the groom for us. And life, friends, has many winding turns and many ups and downs. And there are many times in life that we don't know where the road is leading. But this much we do know. We know our final destination. We will literally live happily ever after because I've read the end of the book. I know how the story ends for us because one day we are going home. As every, every believer, every day that you wake up, brings you one day closer to going on. Amen. Because the groom has gone on ahead. He is preparing a place for us. Because the groom has gone on ahead, preparations have been made, a place where he wants to spend eternity with us. And I often think of the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Because a lot of people suffer in this life. And the Apostle Paul reassures us with these words. What we suffer now is nothing it is nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. So what's our response? What's our response? Just get ready for the wedding. That's your job. 
That's my job. Be prepared for the groom. Anticipate his coming. Yearn for it. Long for it. Look for it. Get ready for it. And live in such a way that the groom would be proud when he comes. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 40. It says, you must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Friends, there's one more important preparation for that is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. If you're in, unsure about that, if you've never done that, if you've just viewed God as some far out deity who's personally not interested in you, then you're missing the very reason you were created. And if today, if today you would, uh, you would do what I did almost 30 years ago, and that is in simple faith, believe, that Jesus Christ died for your sin and receive Him into your life just in your own simple words right here and right now. Jesus Christ will come into your life right here and right now. Would you stand with me? Here's what I want to ask you to do to close our service. And I want to ask you to come forward right where you're at. Would you close your eyes? Posture yourself in an attitude of prayer. And I want you to let your mind dream of that day. To imagine what it will be like at the wedding feast. And what it will be like when we stand face to face with Jesus. And I want you to pray with me. Would you pray, Lord? We have such limited understanding. And our minds cannot even begin to comprehend what that day will be like. But I pray that in these moments we will be captured. That we would be able to imagine what it would be like when we stand before you face to face who has given your life to us, who has pursued us, who has desired us. And even though we are so undeserving, that you would choose us, you choose us by your amazing grace and your love for us. We look forward to that day. It is in that day we place our hope in our hope. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
so good. Yes, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Let us pray. Oh, so, Father, we thank you for this day. Yes, sir. We thank you for a day that we've never seen before. Yes, sir. We're closed in our right hand. Yes, sir. Having all the blood running on in our veins, oh God. Yes, sir. We'd like to say thank you. Yes, thank you for the service right now, Lord. Yes, sir. Thank you for everyone that has come out right now to give you all the glory and honor right now. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you, God, for your mercy. We know it's only you, Lord God. And Lord, when we depart this place, Lord God, we want to depart your spirit. We ask that you guide us, keep us, anoint us, and bring us back together again. Give us another week, Lord God. Better yet, Lord God, give us another day. And Jesus, when we can't praise you any longer, we ask that you give us a home in your kingdom. But we can praise your name forever. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name. Jesus name. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. 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 Amen.